Next, we have the keynote address uh, by Professor Moshir al Hassan, Director General of the National Archives of uh, India. Um, I think I can boast my friendship with uh, uh, Moshir going back, indeed, over 10 years to my very first visit in 1999. I remember uh, being invited to tea in his charming club in Delhi. In the, I do remember the garden, and we did have a, an extreme. You, he, he would not remember, of course, but I do. Uh, it would, um, that was a memorable occasion. Uh, since then, as you know, uh, he became vice chancellor of the Jamia Melia uh, Isma, 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 <coughs> Islami University in, uh, in uh, Delhi. Uh, and uh, in, in 2004, uh, held it till 2009. And it was in this period, indeed, uh, that I heard uh, several times about his. Uh, uh, his uh, valiant effort to protect the rights uh, of the Muslim students, right to political opinion and freedom of speech uh, through the international media, uh, severally and multiply, although we never had a chance to meet in person. And uh, since then, uh, 2010 indeed, uh, he has taken over the National Archives of India, and I hear that he's doing all sorts of wonderful things with organizing it and making it accessible for you generation of, uh, next generation of scholars. Um, and so without further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Mashir al-Hassan to talk about travelogues in Persian and Urdu. Mr. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege to, always a great privilege to be in the city and a great privilege to uh, talk to such an august uh, assembly of, of, of scholars. Uh, I, there isn't much time, so what I want to do is to very briefly uh, read out excerpts of, of some work that I have been engaged in uh, on representing the West, uh, which is based on uh, four travelogues that I have written about and analyzed. And, uh, uh, and uh, the focus of my presentation would be to more to analyze what travelogues are all about, uh, rather than to provide description of what uh, Mr. X wrote or what Mr. Mr. Y wrote. Uh, let me begin straight away by pointing out that uh, Travel books of the past were once regarded as a form of light-minded light -minded indulgence. Uh, today, they attract the curiosity of the readers and scholars in many parts of the world. With the relationship between the East and West at the center of many academic debates, scholars have explored the relationship between the colonized and the colonizer in India, Africa, and indeed the Middle East. There is thus the story of the sources and nature of Muslim knowledge concerning the West and the stages of its growth starting with the first Muslim incursion into Europe and concluding with the first stages of the massive European impact from the late 18th century onwards on the Middle Eastern heartlands of Islam. In this context, there is a remarkable portrait of Al-Hassan Al-Wazan of 16th century society in North Africa of a man with a double vision sustaining two cultural worlds, sometimes imagining two audiences and using techniques taken from the Arabic and Islamic repertoire while unfolding in European elements in his own fashion. According to Al-Biruni, the Arab philosopher who traveled to India in 1017 AD, scholars cannot always strictly adhere to the geometrical method in their discussion, only referring to that which precedes and never to that which follows. He favored introducing in a chapter an unknown factor 
the introduction, the explanation of which can only be given in a later part of the book. That is what Alberoni writes. Taking my cue from Alberoni, my in, this essay really examines the observations and impressions of a number of travelers to the West without adhering to a chronological sequence. I have focused on three in this paper. One is a man called Munshi Hetesamuddin, who went to Europe from Malda region in Bengal. The other is Abu Talib, who went from Awad, and Lutfullah, who went from the Malawa region in the central provinces, who were ultimately, who were until recently not regarded as creditable figures in history or in the travel literature. There is then the sketching out of a terrain upon which 19th and early 20th century British travelers and administrators constructed, at times overlapping and more frequently divergent discourses about the Middle East. Equally revealing from the point of view of Islamic ideology and praxis are the Hajj narratives written by the pilgrims themselves. And I have recently analyzed one such narrative which was produced in, in 1929. Finally, the recent emphasis on mobility and displacement as both features of and metaphors for an increasingly globalized world is accompanied by detailed investigations of the historical relationship between travel and imperialism, mobility and domination. From Al-Biruni to Sayyid Ahmad Khan, the founder of the Aligarh College, travel writers have defied the conventional attitudes of their times to produce works of great interest and value on the historical engagements between different cultures and civilizations. They have engaged not only with not only the Muslim countries, but the world beyond the Darul Islam. Their cross-cultural encounters have been with not only Imperial Britain, but also France, Italy, and Turkey. They valued travel and wrote their own fascinating accounts. The result of the early Indo-Muslim encounters with the West is Shigaraf Nama by Munshi Mirza Tizamuddin, a vivid mixture of travel writing, sociology, social history, and international politics. This is followed by the travels of Mirza Abu Talib Khan, also in Persian. Its author, Mirza Abu Talib, was that rarest of all travel writers, a man with a capacious mind, a warm heart, a happy disposition, and the curiosity to learn. That he had necessary protean quality of mind is shown in his many dramatic monologues and citations from Persian poets, where he presents with fervor a wide variety of opinions and convictions other than his own. No wonder he sought to reach out to the enlightened reader for, I quote, a deliberate and unprejudiced perusal, unquote. Lutfullah, writing in the year of the Great Revolt of 1857, also set his eyes on the same readership. There is a remarkable cross-linking between his well-constructed autobiography and Abu Talib's travels. The two outlined many features in European society and culture, and the permanence of their writings is due to the plain vigor of their style their forthrightness of expression, and their acute observations. Both were fascinated by the strong traditions of raison d'etre, by the cult of unity, and by the passions for equality. Travel and knowledge have been connected in more ways than one. This makes deciphering, deciphering the memory, memoir come travel accounts all the more interesting. Yes, it will not be fair to describe Etisamuddin, Abu Talib, and Lutfullah as plain, ordinary travel writers. These highly intelligent and resourceful men and their travelogues 
belong to the territory of social history, I would submit, embracing a world of technological, social, and political transition. Combined with their endearing prejudices, they surveyed to different degrees and in different ways, industry and agriculture, faith and doubt, morals and ethics, prosperity and poverty, and progress and decline in Europe. In so doing, they spoke their mind without fear to the Muslim divines, statesmen, and others, whatever their rank or influence. Indeed, Etisamuddin, who found himself pushed from the old order into the new, talked of the advanced navigational science of England. He admired Oxford's octagonal observatory and the exhibits in the Medical Institute. Abu Talib, who wrote sketches and essays on people, places, pastimes, and custom in and around London, devoted a whole chapter to the beginnings of industry. In the number and perfection of machines, he saw the prime cause of English wealth and greatness and their superiority over France. His travels and Lutfullah's autobiography cover both comprehensively and at times minutely the state of England before and after the Industrial Revolution. While their passages cannot be compared with the brilliant analysis of this transition by Macaulay in his History of England, they wrote with an air of confident authority about the Industrial Revolution they had genuinely observed and studied. The first book written by, in, by, by, in English by an Indian author, Deen Muhammad, appeared as early as 1794 in Ireland. Yet Charles Stuart introduced Abu Talib's travels as the genuine opinions of a nation scholar. Life in, in, in London was undoubtedly exciting for a man of Abu Talib's taste, for he was gifted with a bright, great love for learn, learning and read a great deal. Moreover, his wit was bright, his humor attractive. He had also got into the habit of associating with cultivated men, the well-born and the well-to-do, and was passionately fond of long and profound arguments on difficult and abstruse subjects. Abu Talib's book therefore touches every social level through personal friendships. By his own account, he fascinated some and influenced others. He met two famous Orientalists, Louis M. Langley, instrumental in establishing the Ecole in Paris, and AIS Sethi, regarded as founder of Arabic study in France, and called on Talleyrand, the French Foreign Minister. A sudden illness prevented him from meeting Napoleon Bonaparte, a child of French Enlightenment. Whenever he went to court or called on one of the princes or a minister of state, the press invariably described him as the Persian prince. Abu Talib moved about Europe with the intention of making his Indianness apparent to all he encountered. Like many Westerners crisscrossing the Islamic world, donning Eastern clothes, they, they may have thought that cross-cultural dressing was integral to their own performance of the West. Eta Samuddin, too, retained his customary turban, shawl, and robe. As the last for language, he knew enough English to translate into Persian the company's dealings with the Indian states. He was present at the Battle of Baksar in October 1764, accompanying General Karnak as his munshi. He helped Captain Swinton to read uh, important books in Persian and to translate Farhanga Jahangiri, a Persian dictionary, while they were on board the ship. He also helped William Jones, the Sanskritist, to compile a Persian grammar. While Abu Talib was not proficient in English, Lutfullah wrote his autobiography in English. The new interest in the language had, of course, a profound influence on his mental life. It led, first of all, to a new stirring of historical self-consciousness. 
And the best passages of his book are in fact those for which his emotional experiences in England provided the basic material. He saw, quote unquote, modernism creeping into England and noted the emergence heterodox trends, although he visited that country before Darwin published his Origin of Species by means of natural selection and invited the wrath of the Christian community. He noted, interestingly enough, the reformers' trends well before John Stuart Mill expounded his utilitarian theory. After all, Mary Wollstonecraft had already proclaimed the vindication of the rights of women in 1792. Lastly, he heard of British imperialism, though its stout defense was magnified only later in the 80s with the publication of the expansion of England in the 18th century by, Rob, by John Seeley. Luthful is ambivalent on certain subjects, but he too repraised the modern age. It is true that he explained the success of British colonialism to the will of God. His assessment of England converges around admiration for the rule of law, the integrity of the justice system, and with serious caveats, the equality of the sexes. I should take uh, another five minutes, you know, ten minutes. Is the West objectively perceived and represented in these books? Do observers color, color fact with fiction? Do they talk of an East-West divide? Doubtless travel narratives have been infiltrated by subjective ideas of cultural, political, and social prejudices. But the one great merit of these works is that unlike many other visitors, they did not assume the West to be a homogeneous civilization, modern, industrial, and Christian. They were aware that borders and boundaries in Europe were demarcated by history and contemporary exigencies as, as we see today. Yet Samuddin and Abu Talib treated Ireland and Scotland as distinct from England and by extension, the people of the two as separate races. This was in sharp contrast to the Indo-Muslim of the 17th and the early 20th centuries, which betrays a profound ignorance of the world beyond the countries adjacent to India. Our travelers even tried to differentiate the use of vocabularies in the different European languages. While being conscious of the limitation of their knowledge and experience, they were acquainted with the history and politics of Europe, past and contemporary, much more, if I may add, uh, much more than, than, than we are acquainted with it. Consequently, the West as such appeared to them to be fluid and fragmented rather than a stable, fixed, and clear entity. Just as India represented an amalgamation of multiple faiths and traditions, so was the West made of citizens who spoke different languages, followed diverse religions, and embraced a wide variety of ideas and ideologies. Again, as in India, they saw that the multiple identities in the West produced bitter conflicts, persecution of religious minorities, and prolonged wars. And I conclude with uh, two or three very brief remarks. The three books belong to a literary genre of Indian interactions with the West in which they played a leading role. Through their example, one can examine how cross-cultural encounters resulted in enhanced understanding of Western cultures, and I'm sure this conference and this society would perform the same role in the years to come, and how each one of them moved between societies and made use of different cultural and intellectual resources to forge relationships and analyze an alien culture. They are of value as a historical record of the decades with, packed with political and religious change and conflict in what was called as the Middle East and India. They are of value, Mr. Chairman, also because they offered, at least to the generation that read their works, a corrective 
to the generalized images of the West. They often demolished humbug and punctured folly. Finally, in terms of describing what it was like to travel by land and sea more than 200 years ago, they supplement the travels to Saudi Arabia during the Hajj period. They describe the hazards of the journey, the arrogance of officials, and their racist attitudes. Ehtisamuddin's three tedious, long and dull days on the ship illustrates what it was like to travel by ship. When considered in the light of the attitudes, the term clash of civilization appears hollow and misnomer in the context of these books. They resembled each other in the bridges they built between different cultures and their perception of elements common among them. Indeed, as in the case of the Egyptian traveler, Rifa al tahtavi they regarded themselves as mediators between cultures. They could well have drawn inspiration from the comment of Ibn al-Arabi to the effect, I quote, each revealed religion is a path that takes to God, and these paths are diverse. Hence, the self-disclosures must be diverse, just as divine gifts are diverse. But he is he, none other than he. Whatever conflict existed was a clash of interests and of policies. It was not a clash of worldviews or cultures, and certainly not a clash of civilizations. As the current political climate in the world attests, the debate is not yet over. In the minds of some, the old age civilization conflict is still on, but one must not paint all writers with the same brush. Serious attempts are also underway to reconcile the believers in both faiths, Islam and Christianity, repudiate Islam and the West as separate and binary categories and challenge the negative and jingoistic pronouncements of religious fanatics. To conclude, Mr. Chairman, the three texts are only the tip of the iceberg. Subsequent generations of writers had their own ideas about the East-West contestation, but they had one thing in common. Their works mirror the many sectarian, regional, class, and other differences that existed between them. Some called for caution in emulating the West, whereas others, such as Sayyid Ahmad Khan, whose wanderings and exchanges in England profoundly impacted on his outlook, recommended the adoption of Western ideas and institutions. In search of practical wisdom, he sought in London knowledge of the sciences. He saw this as integral to the intellectual awakening and material prosperity of the Muslims and underlined profound affinities that link Islam with Christianity and with their common Judaic, Hellenistic, and Middle Eastern antecedents. In Sayyid Ahmad Khan, we hear perhaps an echo of Abu Talib's attempt to work out a modus vivendi with the West in general and with England in particular. The Aliga reformer was indeed the leader of the Muslim Renaissance and his role vis-a-vis -vis Indian Muslims was similar to that of Rafa al tahtavi who helped the late 19th century's growing Arab awareness of the West. He also brought to the genre of Safar Nama the gifts which had already served him well as a historian, notably the power of compelling interests. There remains a need for exploring the West and the Muslim societies from an unsentimental and wide-ranging perspective. Such voices have been heard in Muslim circles. They have, in successive periods, spoken for reconciliation and cross-cultural exchanges. They have spoken against obscurantism and extended their liberal discourses to the interpretation of the Islamic tenets. By extending the frame of reference and rereading the different writings of Indian Muslim travelers within the hundred years between the voyage of Ayat Samuddin and Sayyid Ahmad Khan, it is possible, sir, 
to observe more complexity and nuance than the mainly hostile corpus put together by historians like Bernard Lewis. Thank you very much.